cleanse our sins, heals our hearts, and gives us the companionship of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our dearest God, we thank you that you hear our prayers.
Can we wait until we dismiss the kids until later? Yes. Awesome. go to prayer this morning. I just want to read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. He blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. We are here today as uh, image bearers of the Almighty, and that is a glorious thing. Now we are broken, right? And our hope is that Jesus, who came down to be, to share in our humanity, saved us, right? And we stand in His work. So, on that... Um, let me just mention our uh, missionary of the month before we pray, which is going to be Debbie and um, Terry Baxter. So uh, Terry is uh, having um, tons of speaking engagements. You guys know Terry, that's very common, <laughs> which is a great thing. Uh, so he's just asking that we be praying for him and as, as he goes and speaks, he's just proclaiming the gospel uh, and he's just asking the Lord that he be fruitful in those talks. So let's go before the Lord together and pray this morning. Almighty God, it is such a joy to stand here amongst your people, saved in the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. Father, you are holy. There is none like you. You alone are God. There is no other. You alone are creator. There is no other. And we are grateful that we can stand here bearing your image, but more importantly, bearing your Son as our righteousness. We are grateful for your creation, that we can share in that, that we can participate in it as creatures, but also to see it all around us, as it just shouts your glory, proclaims your handiwork. So we look at the sky and feel the sun and hear the birds, and um, boy, we see the children, all of it is just your handiwork as the almighty artist and we are grateful <coughs> thank you for opening our ears to hear that and uh, Father we just want to uh, take a moment this morning and just ask that your will be done Lord as the almighty creator the sovereign good king that you would just come and rule God we want to see your ways be done we get so tired of our own ways, and man's ways, and Satan's ways. And we are thankful that even those fall under your sovereign hand. And you are in absolute control. And you are good. We are thankful for that, Father. So, just this morning, I wanted to have us take a minute and just spend some time quietly, just proclaiming your, your worship to God. Uh, just in your own heart. Just some ways you've seen His holiness this week. We'll just spend a few minutes to that and then we'll continue in prayer. of your saints. And Lord, we want to see you just take joy in your saints, in your sheep this morning. You are worthy of all praise. And Father, we just approach you through Jesus. Um, and we're grateful for him. So this morning, God, we just have a few requests. Uh, Father, first we want to say a huge thank you for the new lives that you've provided to Daniel and Elizabeth and Nathan and Danielle. We are so thankful for those little babies. They are wonderfully made, and we are thankful for them. God, we just ask that you would be with these families. This, uh, life adjusting to a newborn is a big change. Um, we are thankful that you are our parent, and you know how to do that. 
And uh, God, you are our hope in parenting, and we just ask that you would bless them, and that you would have mercy in these children's souls, and Lord, that you would make them men and women of you, and you would save them. Make them your children. And just give the grace to all of us parents in here as we parent. We don't have what it takes, but you do. And Lord, we just turn to ask for that in everything we do, that you would just come and be our strength. Lord, we want to ask for your forgiveness. We are sinners. And we're thankful that you withhold your wrath and you've placed it on Christ. And yet you've extended grace to us. And we're, we're just so thankful. Do forgive us, Lord. Sanctify your people. Purify them. Fill them with your spirit. Use them as they're out in their jobs and in their homes and in their relationships, God. Come and sit on their thrones. And uh, Father, we just want to thank you so much for the missionaries in our church. Um, today, we just want to say a specific, uh, special thank you for the Baxters, Terry and Debbie, and the work you've done. I'm just so grateful that you've raised up these people, that we can be a body, your hands and feet. And so Lord, we just are thankful for the grace you've had in Terry's life and all these opportunities you give him to speak. And Lord, we just ask that you make those fruitful, that you give him the words to speak, and that Jesus would just be so prominent in everything he does and says. And Lord, we ask that for all of us, that we'd all be faithful in our weakness. Um, just come and be perfect in our weakness. Father. So Lord, we just ask that you come and take joy in the service this morning. We ask that you would just come and feed your sheep through the word of God. We ask that you would just come and speak to your God and protect him. Open our hearts to hear what you have to say. And Lord, we just want to, um, we just want to see you glorified. So please just come and do that. We are thankful for all you do. Lord, help everyone who's struggling today, who's just tired or sick or um, hurt. You are the God of all comfort. And Lord, we long for the day where you just remove all that and we get to be with you in perfection, in your physical presence. We can't wait. Thank you, God, for your goodness. We ask this to the name of your, of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, first off, yeah, as you kind of heard, we have uh, some new children in our body. Uh, we have Ella and Dijkstra, who was born this week. And uh, I believe Bakaya Baxter is here. So can you guys stand? Can we show him off a little bit? Back there, there he is. Daniel can stand. Elizabeth probably should stand. <laughs> yeah, we, well, there he is. <laughs> Such a blessing. Uh, everyone's doing well. So I think what I, when I said is Danielle and Nathan are going to be coming home today, I think. So uh, just really excited for them. I think we'll have a picture come up here too soon. Uh, speaking of children, we have children, child dedication. Uh, so if, if you are interested in that, we're going to do that Father's Day. So if, you're, um, if you'd like to do that, we just use that time to dedicate our children to the Lord and our parenting to the Lord. Uh, if you're interested, you can talk to Pastor Haddon. Um, also, along those children's lines, VBS is coming up. So if you are interested in having your child come, that's for ages 3 years through 6th grade. Uh, 3 years old to 6th grade. So there's a link there you can go to to register. We just ask that you do that. That'd be great. That's July 21st to the 25th. And that'll be in the evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, also, lost and found. We are getting ready to donate those. So if you have lost something, or maybe you didn't know you lost something, just take a quick look in the lost and found um, before we take that out. And uh, otherwise, you can find it at the village. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> um... Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, if, speaking of the babies again, if you guys are interested uh, in just signing up for some meals to provide for the Baxters and the, and the Dijkstra's, um, we can do that on, uh, there's, a, there's a take a meal link that is in the bulletin, I believe. Yeah, in the bulletin. So as one who just came off of a brand new newborn, uh, those are really helpful and you guys are so gracious and uh, we just encourage that. So it's a good way to show Christ love. Uh, yes, also, youth group, just a few things. We have a few different changes. So high schoolers, we are meeting still Sunday nights from 6 to 8 instead of 6.30 to 8. Uh, and we're doing dinner every Sunday. So also, if, um, 
any of you are just awesome at cooking, or maybe you're not awesome at cooking, and you like to do that, <laughs> we'd be happy to take some food. Uh, so if, you're, if you'd like to do that, maybe once a month or once every other month, something, uh, you can come talk to me. The youth would definitely appreciate that. And uh, junior high, we have shifted our meeting from uh, 4 to 6 on Wednesday, sort of 6 p.m. So it's, we start at 6 p.m. and go to 7.30. And that now includes the 5th through 8th graders. So, um, great. I think that's it. And we are going to take a moment and just greet one another in the Lord this morning. And then we'll continue in song. So let's stand and just greet one another.
Take us through our prayer as we prepare to hear God's word this morning. Oh, word of God, speak. Won't you pour down my grave? Washing my Stand with me. We'll do our fighter verse and read our sermon text this morning. All right, if you read the fighter verse aloud with me, it's Psalm 139, 13, and 14. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I have praised you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And then here's our sermon text this morning. It's going to be 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 15. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for the women who profess to worship God. A woman is to learn quietly with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Continuing in our study of First Timothy this morning, and um, let's just pray before we look into God's word now. Father, we're thankful that your word is truth, and that your word speaks to us about the things that matter to us, Lord. Father, we th we're thankful that you love your sons and you love your daughters, and that um, you've spoken to us here in your word, specifically to uh, our sisters in Christ, Lord about so many things that are important, Lord. And so we pray that, first of all, that you would help us to receive your word with meek and humble hearts, Lord. We want to we wanna submit ourselves to your word and ask that you would give us hearts that are receptive and welcoming to your word. And Father, we pray that you would help us to see your goodness here as we look into the scriptures. Oh, Lord, there's so much goodness and so much grace and so much love from you in this text. And so help us to, to see that and I pray that you'd help us to honor you in the way that we love our lives, that we who are men would honor you as men, that the women would honor you as women, and that in all that we do, Lord, that the name of Jesus would be glorified. And so speak your word to us now, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2019, there is hardly an issue that's more of a lightning rod than the roles of men and women. God created us male and female in his own image, and we are equal before him, and we are different. A man is not a woman, and a woman is not a man. There are things that are unique to men and other things that are unique to women. And that's part of God's good plan for us. Our Creator, our creator made us equal in value and different in our roles, and he created us that way because he loves us. 
We know that God is good. We know that He's our Heavenly Father, and that He loves us, and so we can trust Him. And we can even trust Him in the things that He teaches us uh, about things that are controversial in 2019. Now, in this passage, of course, God is speaking to Christian women. And we can come to God's Word with faith and with confidence that the Word of God is true, that the Word of God is clear, and that the Word of God is good. Everything that God says to women in this passage is for their good. It is, it is for your good, sisters in Christ, because your Father in Heaven loves you. There are four main topics in this passage that we're going to look at. First of all, Paul is going to talk about women's adornment, what that means. Secondly, he's going to address women's roles within the church. Thirdly, he's going to give us some, some reasons, some really some theological reasons for those roles. And then fourthly, he's going to encourage women to honor Christ as women specifically in the way that, they're, that, that they live their lives. And so, Paul begins these instructions for women by speaking about how they are to adorn themselves. Verses 9 and 10. Paul writes that, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braid of hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Now, you might wonder, why does Paul address this issue of how women should adorn themselves? Why is Paul concerned about the way that women dress, with their appearance, and so forth? I think that it's because Paul simply knows that this matters to women. You probably know some men who would be perfectly content to never ever look in a mirror. They're just not concerned at all about their appearance. But you know what? I don't think you know any women like that. <laughs> this is part of the way that God created them. They, they care about this. And you know what? God is so kind that he doesn't leave us in the dark about things that matter to us. Women care about their appearance, that's part of the way that God made them, and so God's Word speaks to us about the issues that we care about. And so God has basically three things to say here uh, about, the women, about the way that Christian women should adorn themselves. First of all, He says that they should be adorned with respectable apparel, with modesty, and with self-control. Now what does it mean for women to dress modestly? Well, I'm not going to get into specifics because Paul doesn't. Paul is not a legalist who's going to just take out the tape measure and say, your skirt has to be this many inches long. He's not going to do that. He's not going to go there because he's not a legalist. To be modest basically means that you're not pushing the limits. I think all of us know what is immodest, what is seductive. And Paul is saying, don't just try to get as close as you can to the line without stepping over the line. No, just, just don't push the limits. And then he talks about self-control. And this... This word, translated self-control, really has to do with the way you, that you think. Uh, wise thinking, good, using good judgment. In other words, he's saying, don't just go along with the latest fad without thinking about it. Especially if the latest fad is inappropriate. Paul is saying, don't just follow the crowd, think for yourself. <laughs> Use good judgment without the Holy Spirit and adorn yourself in a way that's respectful and that honors the Lord. His second instruction here in the uh, latter part of verse 9 is to avoid braided hair and gold and pearls and costly attire. Now, does that mean that women should never braid their hair? That they should never wear gold jewelry? Well, I, I don't think so. I think Paul is using a little bit of hyperbole here, especially because the bride in the Song of Solomon uh, wears gold jewelry, and she's praised for that. I don't think that Paul would say that the bride in the Song of Solomon was in sin because of that. And so... Uh, what is Paul trying to say? Well, I think he's trying to encourage women, don't let your heart be consumed with how you look and with what you wear. In other words, don't let your treasure be in your appearance. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is in what you're wearing, then your heart will be tied up with that. You don't want that. You want Jesus to be your treasure. Do you remember Mary, the sister of Lazarus, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? His sister Mary, in Mark 14, a few days before Jesus was crucified, she took a very expensive bottle of perfume that was worth a whole year's wages, and she broke it, and she poured it out on Jesus. And Jesus said, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. 
Jesus wants people everywhere in the whole world to learn from this woman's example. You know why? It's because her treasure was Jesus. She loved Jesus more than she loved her perfume, more than she loved money, more than she loved anything else. And so, I don't think that Paul is prohibiting women from ever wearing nice things. He's just saying, don't let them be your treasure. <laughs> let Jesus be your treasure. Make sure that you love Jesus more than you love your clothes or your jewelry or your appearance or anything else. And so then the third thing that Paul teaches women about their adornment is that they should adorn themselves with good works. Verse 10 says that this is proper, it is fitting for women who profess godliness, women who treasure Christ. Really, adornment is about beauty, isn't it? And what's beautiful in God's eyes? In God's eyes? Good works. God is not impressed by women who are outwardly very beautiful and whose hearts are ungodly. God cares about your heart. He cares about your, the way that you live your life a lot more than he cares about your outward appearance. Because your heart is what's beautiful in God's eyes. It's interesting that the Apostle Peter teaches the same thing. In 1 Peter 3, Peter writes, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And so, sisters in Christ, when your heart is filled with love for Jesus, when your heart is gentle and, and peaceful, God says to you, that is real beauty. <clears throat> that is precious in my sight. And so, let me just speak a word here to, to the men. Brothers, let's encourage our wives to be adorned with good works. If you are a married man, you can be incredibly helpful to your wife. Would you let your wife know that, that she is beautiful in your sight, for one thing? You know, if, if you've ever read the Song of Solomon... You've probably noticed that the groom in the Song of Solomon absolutely adores his bride, and he lets her know it. And in, in fact, it's interesting if, if you really look at the text, the groom knows that his bride is not perfect. He knows she is not like a, show, uh, a Photoshop woman on the cover of a magazine. But you know what? He loves her just as she is. And he praises her and praises her and praises her for, his, for her beauty. Brothers, let your wives know that they are beautiful in your eyes. And let's encourage our, our, our wives to focus on inner beauty, to focus on living godly lives. What, what can you do, if you're a husband, to help your wife to become more and more like Christ? Have you ever thought about that question? What can you do to help your wife to grow in her inner beauty? How can you pray for her? How can you encourage her to spend time in God's Word? How can you help her to grow in her walk in Christ? And so that's the first thing that God wants to teach the women that follow Christ. Your internal beauty is so much more important than anything external, and your inner beauty is precious in the sight of God. The second thing that God has to say to women in this passage has to do with their role in the church. Verses 11 and 12, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach her to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And so, in these two verses here, there, there's something that women should do, and something that they should not do. First of all, they should learn. Christianity is not like Islam, where they set up a curtain towards the back of the mosque, and all the women have to stand behind the curtain. We're not like that in Christianity. No, we believe, on the basis of God's word, that women are not inferior to men at all. Women are welcome to learn about Christ, to grow in Christ. And in the first century, when Paul wrote this, this was absolutely revolutionary. Because in most other religions, women were simply not welcome to learn. In fact, do you know where the first place was in the world where women were publicly educated? Where women were educated at the, at the expense of the, of, the, of the public? It was in Geneva, Switzerland, when the Protestant reformer John Calvin uh, was the pastor there. Calvin saw women are created in the image of God and the first time in history, in the middle of the 1500s, women were publicly educated. And so, <clears throat> women, you are welcome to learn. And this is, this is, this is a world-changing thing, really. 1 Timothy 2.11 has changed the world in the last 2,000 years. And then according to verse 12, what women are not to do 
is to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> well, when Paul talks about teaching, especially here in First and Second Timothy and, and in Titus, he's talking about the public teaching of God's word. He's talking about the authoritative teaching that takes place when the church is gathered. He's talking about really the exposition of Scripture. This is what we would call the sermon in the worship service. Other verses in 1 Timothy show that, that the role of preaching is the role of pastors and elders. For example, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, which we'll look at next Sunday, Lord willing, it says that elders and overseers must be able to teach. That's because it's their role within the worship service. Chapter 5, verse 17, talks about elders who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, let me just be really clear that women are still welcome to teach other women. In fact, Titus 2 commands the older women to teach the younger women. Women are welcome to teach children, but this task of, of preaching the sermon, teaching the authoritative word of God from the pulpit, this is the, a male responsibility. And then Paul talks about this idea of exercising authority in the church. And that's talking about the responsibility to lead and to oversee the church as a whole. Again, this is the role of pastors and elders. You see the same thing in that, in that very same verse in chapter 5. It talks about the elders who rule well. The elders who rule well. So governing in the church is an elder responsibility. And so it's clear in 1 Timothy and other places in the New Testament as well that there are certain roles that God has given specifically to men. And especially to those men who are the elders of the church. And we're going to look into the, Paul's teaching on eldership next week. Those roles and responsibilities for the elders include teaching the whole congregation and exercising authority over the church as a whole. Claire Smith is an Australian woman with a PhD in New Testament, I think from the University of Sydney. And she is also the author of a book about the biblical roles of men and women uh, called God's Good Design. And a few years ago, many churches in Australia were having debates about whether or not to ordain women as pastors. And there was a young reporter, who was not a Christian, who interviewed Claire Smith about it. And this reporter asked Dr. Smith if there was a Bible verse that supported her belief that women should not be ordained as pastors. And Claire Smith quoted these two verses from 1 Timothy 2. And the reporter said, that's what it says? And Dr. Smith said, yes, that's, that's what it says. And she was thinking, oh boy, I need, I'm going to need to explain this now. I'm going to have to try to defend it. I'm going to have to try to explain why this is still applicable to the church today. And the reporter just said, well, what's the argument about that? I would have thought that if that's what it says, that sells it, doesn't it? <laughs> and that night, when, this, when that story was aired on TV, the news station actually printed out these two verses on the screen for everyone to read. This young, non-Christian reporter realized the Bible is clear about the question of women serving as Pastors. It's clear that this is a role that's reserved for, for men. Really, the issue here is not one that's difficult to understand. The, the issue is not whether or not the Bible is clear. The issue is, are we willing to accept what the Bible clearly teaches? Are we willing to submit to the authority of the inspired Word of God? Are we willing to believe that what God has said about men's roles and women's roles is good? And do we believe that God has given men and women these distinct roles because he loves us. And when you look at the rest of the New Testament, you see that even the role, even though the role of publicly teaching the church, preaching the sermon, and exercising authority as elders, even though this role, these roles are reserved for men, there are countless other things, countless things that women are welcome to do. The ministry of women in the church is incredibly, incredibly important. Let me just give you a few examples from elsewhere in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, there were several uh, women who hosted churches in their homes. For example, the church in Philippi, which was probably about the best church in the whole New Testament. They were just an awesome church. They were the church with like hardly any problems. Lydia hosted that church in her house. <clears throat> women prayed and prophesied in the church, in 1 Corinthians 11. So women are involved in the worship service. They're publicly speaking in the worship service. They're not giving the sermon, but they have other important roles in worship. 
In Philippians 4, Paul refers to a few women as fellow workers in the gospel. I don't know exactly what that means, but evidently these women were probably missionaries of some sort, uh, spreading the gospel uh, along with Paul. In Romans 16, Paul talks about Phoebe, who was a servant of the church and a patron of Paul. So she was a, a, a very helpful supporter of Paul's ministry. If you think about Timothy, the man that these two books of the Bible were written to, his mother and grandmother uh, get the credit in 2 Timothy for raising him to follow Christ and for teaching him the scriptures. The list could go on and on and on. The point is that there are countless ways for women to be involved in ministry and that women should be involved in ministry. Every believer, whether you're, whether you're male or female, is called to fulfill the Great Commission, to make disciples, to speak the Word of God to one another, to build up our fellow believers. I, I, I think we can think about it this way. Remember the Garden of Eden, when God said to Adam, look at all these beautiful trees that have made Adam, and you can enjoy all the fruit of them except for this one. You just need to avoid this one particular tree, the fruit of the knowledge of, of, of good and evil. 1 Timothy 2 is saying that there's this one specific role in the church that's not for women, but only for men. But there are so many, so many other ministries that they can enjoy. The possibilities for women to build up the church are almost endless. The way that you, sisters in Christ, can build up the church and advance the kingdom of God is just more than I can imagine. And so that's God's instruction for women in the church. They're not permitted to function in the, in the teaching, governing role that's reserved for men as pastors and elders, but they should learn, they should be built up. You, my sisters in Christ, are welcome to minister in countless ways. And so that leads to the question, why does Paul command men and not women to fulfill these particular roles in the church of teaching and governing? Paul's instructions are clear, but what's the reason behind these instructions? The answer to that question is found back in the book of Genesis. Paul is going to remind us now of the story of Adam and Eve in the first three chapters of the Bible. He's going to remind us of God's original design for creation. And that tells us, and I think this is important, that these instructions in 1 Timothy 2 are not based in culture, which changes over time. In other words, you can't argue, well, you know, Paul was just following the culture of his day where men were in leadership positions and women were not. That was first century culture. In the 21st century, times have changed, and so these, these instructions are no longer applicable. No, no, no. What Paul teaches here in 1 Timothy about the roles of men and women, it's not based in first century culture. It's not based in 21st century culture. It's based on God's original plan in creation. And so it's applicable no matter what culture we live in. So Paul has two reasons here for why men and not women should lead the church by te teaching and exercising authority. The first reason is verse 13, which says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. God made Adam first out of the dust of the earth, and then Eve out of Adam's rib. Now why does that matter? <laughs> well, why is that important? It's because in the Old Testament, and in, really in the world of Hebrew thought, the first person in the family always had the role, uh, a special role, of leadership. For example, the firstborn son in a family would be the leader among his brothers and sisters. And he would even receive a greater share of the inheritance than the rest of the family. Paul noticed in the story of Genesis, I mean, just one day as he, as he was reading his devotions in Genesis, he noticed that Adam was created out of the dust of the earth, and then, later, that day, on the sixth day, Eve was created out of Adam's rib to be his helper. And he saw, well, that means that Adam is the first, and so he's the, the leader in the family. Paul's inference is that if God created the man to be the leader in the family, then men should also have the role of leadership in the church family. The second reason that Paul gives us for why men particularly should have this uh, role of teaching and governing in the church is verse 14. Paul writes there that Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, I need to say, Paul is not arguing here that women are more gullible than men. He's not saying, well, she was deceived because women are gullible, or because women are less intelligent than men. That is the furthest thing from Paul's thought. 
If that were the case, he would have never commanded women in Titus 2 to teach other women. I mean, can you, I, it's unthinkable that Paul would say, well, women are gullible, they're not very intelligent, but they can teach one another. <laughs> that, that's ridiculous. Paul believes and he knows that women are just as intelligent as men are. They are not more gullible. And so, so, so what is going on here? The woman was deceived and, and became the transgressor. What does he mean? Well, in the first chapters of Genesis, you notice that there's a certain order. There's a certain authority structure, if you want to say it that way. God is the authority over human beings, over Adam and Eve. Within that marriage between Adam and Eve, Adam is the leader. And Eve is to submit to Adam as her husband. And then together, Adam and Eve have dominion over the rest of the world, including the animals, including the serpent, who shows up in Genesis 3. Now, when Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that order was flipped on its head. The serpent deceived Eve in eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve led Adam into sin. Instead of Adam leading his wife, he, which Adam should have taken out his shovel and, and hit that snake on the head with it, but instead, Adam led Eve into sin, and then together, they rebelled against God. The whole structure was flipped upside down. And so Paul is telling women, God's created order is good. It is God's design for men to, to have the leadership role in the family and in the church, in their role as elders. And so don't make the same mistake that Eve made by trying to reverse the order, by taking, trying to take the place that's reserved for men. Because the results are not going to be good, just like they were not good for Eve. And so the reason that women are not permitted to lead the church by teaching God's word and exercising authority is, is rooted in God's creation, all the way back to the very beginning of human history in Genesis. There are particular responsibilities that God has given to men, and that's part of his design for the human race. There are other responsibilities that God has given only to women that men do not have, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But first, I need to say a couple things about this. First of all, as men, it's our responsibility to step, in, to step up and lead. We're going to see that next Sunday as we look into Paul's teaching on elders. It is a good thing for men to pursue the office of the elder, he's going to tell us in chapter 3. We as men have a great responsibility to, to lead God's church. And the same is true in the home. As husbands and fathers, we cannot be passive. We cannot abdicate our role as leaders. It is crucial for us to lovingly lead our wives, as servant leaders, that is, not as tyrants, but as servant leaders. Let me ask you, brothers, are you providing godly spiritual leadership in your home? Are you leading your wife to follow Christ? Are you leading your children to follow Christ? Will you commit yourself to putting in the time and energy that are necessary to lead your family in a way that is for their good, to lead them in a way that glorifies God. I also need to say that just because men have the role of leadership in the home and in the church does not make men superior to women, it does not make men better than women. Let me say this very clearly, men and women are equal in value, in dignity, and in worth. We are both created in the image of God. One is not superior to the other. Genesis 1.27, which Pastor Nathan read earlier, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Men are created in God's image. Women are created in God's image. There is no greater dignity than being created in the image of God. This makes every human being, both male and female, incredibly, unfathomably valuable. And so as men and women, we are equal in value, we are equal in worth, and we're also different from one another. And this is just part of God's good design. In fact, Christianity has always affirmed that women are precious in God's sight, that women are not inferior to men in any way, that women are incredibly valuable members of the church. In fact, in the first couple of centuries after Christ, Christianity was so appealing to women that up to two-thirds of Christians at that time were, may have been female. 
That's a remarkable thing. In the first couple hundred years after Jesus, up to two-thirds of Christians were, were female, which is even more um, surprising because at that time, the population of the Roman Empire was almost the opposite of that. It, the, the Roman people would often have female babies and say, oh, I don't want a girl, and let the child die. Infanticide. And with, with childbirth and the dangers of childbirth in the ancient world and so forth, there was just a, a, a general lack of women in the society. It was probably at least three-fifths uh, male, maybe even two-thirds male. And so, well, why, why was it that Christianity was so very appealing to women? Well, the church historian Michael Kruger writes that the main reason for that is that Christianity offered a more favorable and positive environment for women as compared to the position of women in the broader Greco-Roman world. And that favorable, favorable environment included opportunities for real involvement in ministry, like we've seen earlier. It included the fact that there was no tolerance among Christians for female infanticide. It included the fact that Christian husbands were expected to be faithful to their wives and to love their wives. And yet that was the opposite of what was the common practice in Roman society where men, where women are expected to be faithful, but men could be as promiscuous as they wanted to be. And so the, the early church created this environment that was just so uh, accommodating and welcoming to women that just the, the women flocked to the church. And re it's really an amazing thing. And so men and women are different. They have different roles to play within the church. But at a fundamental level, Christianity has always affirmed that men and women are equal, they are created in the image of God, and we are loved equally by our Heavenly Father. Now, in the last verse of this passage, Paul is going, uh, has one more point to make. So far, he's taught us, first of all, that, that women should adorn themselves with good works. Secondly, he's taught us about the specific roles of women in the church. Thirdly, he gave us a reason, uh, actually a couple reasons from Genesis, about the difference in roles between men and women. And now, fourthly, he's going to tell us that God wants women to thrive in the specific roles that he's designed for them. Verse 15 is difficult to understand. So I'm going to read it, and then we'll dig into it. It says, Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Have you ever read that verse and wondered, what does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean that women will be saved through childbearing? <laughs> First of all, I think it's important to mention that when Paul talks about women being saved, he's not telling us that they earn their salvation through childbearing. He's not saying, ladies, if you want to go to heaven, you need to have a lot of babies. That's not, that's not what he's saying here. It's very clear in this very chapter of 1 Timothy that the only way that we're saved is, trust, is by trusting in Christ, by trusting in what he's done on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Just look up at verses 5 and 6 here in 1 Timothy 2. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Whether you are a man, or a woman, or a boy, or a girl, you can be saved by putting your faith in Jesus as the Savior who died to pay your ransom so that your sins can be forgiven. And so back in verse 15, when Paul is talking about women being saved, he is talking about women being preserved in their faith. Paul actually uses this word in that way uh, several other times uh, in First and Second Timothy. He's talking about women being preserved from Satan's attacks, preserved from false teaching, preserved from other things that would threaten their faith. Think about the rest of this verse. If a Christian man, woman, or a Christian man, for that matter, or a Christian child, continues in faith and love and holiness with self-control, then of course that person is going to be preserved in, that, in their faith. Of course that person is not going to fall prey to Satan. And so, in verse 15, Paul is not talking about earning your salvation. It's only a gift of God's grace that you can only receive by faith. He's talking about the way that we preserve, that we persevere as believers. The way that we keep on walking faithfully with Jesus. And so with that in mind, what is Paul teaching here about childbearing? Well, one thing that we know about childbearing is that this is something that only women can do. It's not just that men should not bear children. Men cannot bear children. It is impossible. 
This is a unique role that God has given to women and not to men. And it is a glorious role, is it not? To bring new life into, into the world. I, th I, I think that's so interesting that in the, in the, you know, as other denominations have debated about women pastors, and women have said, well, I can't be a pastor. It doesn't seem like that's fair. Wait a second, that's not fair that men can't have babies, is it? <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> This is something unique that God has given to women. And so, Paul is probably using a, a figure of speech here where the one part stands for the whole. That is, that God has given certain responsibilities to women and not to men. Childbearing is just one of them, but there are, but there are others. But childbearing is the one that's most obviously a uniquely female role. Christian women, Paul is saying, Christian women are called to be who God created them to be as women and to fulfill their unique female calling. Now, what does that involve? Well, it involves bearing children, obviously. That's a uniquely female thing. It includes nurturing those children. There is something special about the way that a mother nurtures her, nurtures her children, isn't there? In fact, Paul himself alludes to this over in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says there, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Mothers are gentle. They are nurturing in ways that fathers are not. We're, we're, we're just not as good at this as mothers are. <laughs> Martin Luther said that when the angels see a mother changing a diaper, they smile. When the angels see a, man, a, a father changing a diaper, they laugh. <laughs> Now, the role of a father is incredibly important, but the fact is, fathers and mothers are different, and children need the love, and the care, and the gentleness that can only come from mom. Now, what else does God expect from his daughters? Well, 1 Timothy 5.10 points, points out a few more things. Christian women are to, to bring up children, to show hospitality, to wash the feet of the saints, to care for the afflicted, to devote, to devote themselves to every good work. Just think about those things. Both men and women are called to show hospitality. In fact, that's a requirement for elders in chapter 3. But women are uniquely gifted in making a home welcoming and enjoyable and, and pleasant and a place for, for friendship and, and fellowship. Think about caring for the afflicted. There's a reason why over 90% of the, of the nurses in the United States are female. They're just, they're just good at helping the sick and the afflicted. Women are generally more compassionate than men. These are just a few of the unique ways that God has gifted women, and not men. And let me just mention, uh, for any women who want to grow in their, in their unique God-given roles as women, we have this Titus II ministry. That ministry is all about mature women helping other women uh, and, and teaching them what it means to follow Jesus specifically as a woman, how to fill God's unique calling for you as a, as a female follower of Christ. And so when the Titus II ministry opens up again in August, that's just a, a great opportunity for all the ladies in the church to grow in their faith. I should also mention, you don't need to be a mother. You don't need to even be a married woman to fulfill God's calling for you. If you have never borne children, you can still nurture life in others. You can still serve God's people and care for the afflicted and do all sorts of things that honor Christ in a uniquely female way. And so in the final verse of this passage, Paul is saying to every Christian woman, God made you in a wonderful way. He has given you strengths and abilities that are unique to women. Enjoy that. Be who you are as a Christian woman. Don't allow the world to define womanhood for you. It will only confuse you. Let the Bible define womanhood for you. And if you follow Christ as a biblical woman, you know what? Christ will be honored. And you will experience great joy. And the people around you, your husband, your children, others that you care about, they will be blessed through you, sisters. And so brothers, let's encourage our wives in their particular role as Christian women. Being a mother is hard. <laughs> let's encourage our wives. Let's let them know that we appreciate everything that they do. Let's love our wives as Christ loves the church, in a way that's sacrificial, in a way that's selfless. And let's help them to, to walk with Jesus, and to grow in their faith, and to really flourish as Christian women. 
Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your word. Thank you that you love every one of us. And that there's no <clears throat> that there are no second class citizens in your kingdom. Lord, that you you love all of us as your children, as sons and daughters. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us as a church to just continue to to pursue biblical manhood and biblical womanhood and to, to live this out in our in our church and in our families and in our individual lives, Lord, and that you would be honored, Lord, as we live according to the good design that you have for us. And so we thank you, Father. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And thank you for your truth that, that lights our way and that shows us the way forward and that guides us as we seek to live for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to pray with someone this morning, there will be a prayer team available here at the front, and they'd love to spend some time with you. Let's stand together and go with God's blessing. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.